It is my distinct privilege now to introduce an exceptional, an exceptional boss lady, Sylvia Malenge, who will inspire us. Sylvia is currently, ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Consumer Officer of Safaricom. Now, it need not be said, Safaricom is the most profitable organization with a marketing cap, market capitalization of 11.7 billion US dollars. So the most profitable company in East and Central Africa. She is the commercial leader who is responsible for driving the company's shareholder returns, for delivering the and creating preference for the Safaricom brand. Over the last 20 years, Sylvia has developed a strong track record in strategic thinking, in brand building, in new business development, commercial execution, as well as people growth and development in the telecommunications, as well as in the fast moving consumer goods sector. She says she's inspired by driving positive change in society. And clearly it is not just lip service because when you look at her awards, she has been appointed to the presidential award scheme. This is one that really looks at upskilling the youth, developing their skills so that they make a difference, not just to their communities, but to Kenya and to the world at large. Sylvia, Sylvia was named as one of the most influential African women in 2020. She's also been feted as Kenya's top 25 women in digital 2019 and cited as Kenya's top 40 under 40 for three consecutive years. She's a 2015 Young Global Leaders Recipient Award. This was given to her by the World Economic Forum, and they give this to distinguished and exceptional global leaders who are below the age of 40. Now, if this does not tell you she's a boss lady, she's also a certified executive coach, meaning she makes time to coach leaders. She's a Bachelor of Science graduate from University of Nairobi, but listen to this. She had the highest distinction of first class honors. Her passion for transforming lives, leadership, women empowerment, and creating community <clears throat> impact has had her serving on various boards. And after all this, after all is said and done, this is what Sylvia tells us that for her, the most treasured role is that of being a mother to her two beautiful children. Ladies and gentlemen, let us join me. Please let us welcome Sylvia Mulenge. <laughs> Thank you very Sylvia. much for that uh, warm welcome. Um, I'm really humbled um, just to be in your presence, um, especially uh, having spent um, the last uh, hour or two uh, just listening uh, to the different speakers um, and especially uh, listening to all the different uh, Toastmasters as they came to make, um, to speak. Um, and I think that's just where I want to start by first of all, starting off by con congratulating everyone, first of all, who has had the courage of conviction and just the, the, the desire to come and express the gift that uh, God has placed in them and uh, coming to share it with us today. I have been enlightened. I have, uh, I have laughed. I have enjoyed uh, listening uh, to the various conversations. And I'm really, really, um, really privileged and blessed to be in your midst this day. I've also noticed that some of my friends are Toastmasters I didn't even know. I'm seeing them writing to me. Uh, hi, Rosanne. I think she's somewhere in the audience. Uh, Terry, I think I, I, I know quite a number of two. So I'm privileged. And actually, one of my colleagues, uh, Steve Miner, who we work with uh, in Safaricom, is actually the one who invited me and to, told me about this great organization. So really, really, really uh, very happy to be here. So as has been said, uh, my name is uh, Sylvia Mulinge. I'm a mother of two. 
beautiful teenagers, Jason and Jasmine. Jason came home yesterday. He's on half term. He's currently doing his exams. So really good to have him home. Um, and his sister, Jasmine, uh, I, they, they really are the joy of my life. Um, I, I work in a, one of the, I have, I have had a career of about 22 years um, in a, a commercial leadership roles, uh, working in Unilever as well as Safaricom. I spent the last 16 years or so uh, in Safaricom. And I think that what I will be sharing with you today has it's just the lessons that I have picked um, out of the journey that I've been privileged uh, to have. Uh, the, the lessons may, may make sense to some of you. Some of you may choose to challenge them, and that's okay. That's why we're in a conversation. And one of the things that I really, really applaud and love is just having different uh, diversity of thought. Because I think when we create a world where people are free to express their authentic selves and just have um, that diversity of thought, then means that we we are creating a world uh, that is better uh, able to accommodate us all. So where would I start? Um, I, I think I'll start off by um, just uh, reflecting on my week because when I was told that uh, I'm coming to speak to you and I hope somebody's going to let me know uh, the time so that I don't talk around the time. Um, I was wondering what, what, what am I going to speak about and um, I normally lean in and uh, look at uh, the experiences that I'm going through because I normally believe that your, your story is, is the best place to be able to draw um, the lessons that you want to speak to because they're authentic to you and you can actually uh, make them relatable to the people that you're speaking to. And as I was doing that, um, an event that popped up in my mind was a, a conversation that I was really, really privileged to be enjoying in this week um, through uh, the efforts um, of one a lady I work with called uh, Karen, who is a director of uh, sustainability. And she invited one of uh, the leaders that I really admire called Paul Pullman, uh, who came to visit us. Uh, in Safaricom, and uh, he was sharing with us about the things uh, that he's passionate about. He's a purpose, uh, a very purposeful leader, and I am a big believer in purpose. And one of the reasons why probably I have been able to remain engaged and active uh, in the roles I have done is because they are roles that have connected with my own individual purpose. And as he spoke, he then uh, spoke to us about his book, which is actually the book that I'm reading this weekend. Um, if you get a chance, uh, it's a book called Net Positive, written by Paul Pullman and uh, Andrew Riston. It's a fantastic read. But one of the things that really um, struck my mind that I took away uh, from the conversation we had with him is he said that you, you cannot be a great leader if you're not first a great human being. And now that is a place that I want to start because many times when we think about bosses, um, and for those of us who are probably younger, you think about um, the, the, the privileges or the comforts that come with your understanding or the picture that comes in your mind when you think about the word boss. Um, many of us are probably here or are, are here because you were inspired by the theme of, of this session or of this conference that uh, says uh, we want to learn how to make boss moves. And even when I try to think about that statement in the form of a color, it sounds very red, it sounds very aggressive, it sounds very, you know, out there, ambitious, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think one of the things that um, has happened to humanity is that people think that, um, or, or that everybody wants to get to the top. And many of us, uh, when we are given the option of whether you want to be at the top or the bottom of the food chain, everybody says, I want to be at the top. Why? Because when I'm at the top, I have influence, I have power, I probably have the packs that come with, 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 with all that. And what I just want to offer based even on my own personal journey and what I have learned, the mistakes that I have made, um, and even now the lessons from leaders such as uh, Paul Pullman, as I was referring to earlier, is that if you can't be a great human being, it is impossible for you to actually lead sustainably. And that's what I want to start off by offering to us as your number one uh, boss move, right? Be a great human being if you want to be a boss 
that will inspire followership, if you want to be a boss that will be able to uh, create a legacy that will outlive you. I personally am a person who lives my life from a legacy mindset. And this was inspired um, by going into a funeral for one of my friends who had lost their dad. And as I sat in the back of the church and I was listening to the eulogy being read, I figured, you know, and, and, and understood that, you know, all the things that this guy had done, all the achievements that he had done had actually boiled down to a series of paragraphs that are going to describe what people thought about him. And it was not about the car he drove, the places he worked, which are important, or the innovations he made, but it was about the impact that he created in the lives of people. And for me, from that day, I made a personal choice that I wanted to be a person who would live my life from the perspective of, I want to create positive impact in the spaces that I find myself in. Whether in my role as a mother, in my role in community, in my role in the workplace, in my role in interacting with my friends, I wanted to be somebody who would create a positive impact in the spaces that I found myself in. And thinking, I think from that perspective then allowed me then to begin to think about how do I lead with intention when I now brought it back into my space of work? How do I become deliberate about building deep, meaningful, connected relationships with the people that I work with? Because ultimately as a boss, as a leader, you're not the smartest person in the room. You just have the privilege to lead a group of smart people who probably know what it is that they want to get done. Um, but your role as a leader is to figure out how do I inspire and unleash the energy that is in them so that they can rise up to be the best versions of themselves and in their rising and performing at their best level then even you as a leader, because this is your team, you ultimately end up rising. Now, that then forms the crux of my, probably if I may call it my boss move number two. You must be a leader who is willing to lead with purpose and be willing to lead with intention. You must have the capacity as an individual to be able to connect with other people help them to solve their problems. And you cannot do that if you don't form deep relationships. I think it was this week or last week, I attended um, um, a session with our, our technology colleagues who are going through a leadership dialogue. And they had invited a gentleman called Tim uh, who came uh, to speak to them. And there's something Tim that said that really, really struck me. Um, I think he works for an organization called Paragon, so all credits, credits to him. But he said something around the fact that it is impossible for you to actually, well, okay, first of all, let me, let me backpedal a bit. What is the role of a leader? The, the role of a leader is to make, do I want to say it like this, make probably unreasonable requests, yes? that probably define the future and then inspire the energy of your team to actually get those unreasonable, and I say unreasonable in apostrophes because they seem impossible, but they probably then set the vision that is high enough for your people to want to pursue and get it done. The work of a leader is to create problems that are worth solving, that will make people get out of bed to actually come and want to solve them. Now, I get back to Tim's comment. So I've provided you with that context. That's your work as a leader. But then Tim said something that really struck me. He says that the size of the relationships that you have will determine the ability that you have to actually deliver on the tasks that have been given to you. And you know, when I reflected on that, especially with my, in my career, um, in my role in Safaricom, I have worked in different spaces. So as I said earlier, I've been there for about 16 years uh, and the different roles I've held have uh, been in, in commercial, uh, mainly 
uh, looking to drive turnaround or transformative um, kind of executions. We were setting up our fixed business. I went there, uh, rolling out of our retail estates, uh, growing our consumer business, even in the face of very aggressive competition in the Kenyan market. And I remember one of the things that really, really struck with me is that how much I depended on other people to understand the vision that the company was pursuing and getting them uh, enamored and growing on that vision so that we all jointly execute it together. Because at the end of the day, you can't execute it by yourself. And it was important for me then to be able to invest in the relationships, especially for my key stakeholders to actually get that done. And therefore, when Tim said that, he said that the size of the relationship that you have will have an impact on your ability to be able to deliver on your task. So if you have a big task like this, I don't know if I can see it on the screen, and your relationships are this size, you won't be able to deliver on your tasks because at the end of the day, you depend on your ability to be able to influence others to actually get the work done for you in or in service of the vision that you have to actually get it accomplished and executed. And that then draws back to what I was saying about leading with purpose and leading with intention, being deliberate about building deep, meaningful, empathetic, connected relationships, because that is what is going to stand you in the long term. I can tell you that the traditional model of leading by command, a, a command and control kind of culture does not work with the generation that we have today. It is not even sustainable. Our work as leaders is to cultivate a much more collaborative kind of an environment where people are willing to engage, where people are willing to give you their best because they know you care for them, because they know that you are willing to go the extra mile for them. And because of that, they will give a hundred plus percent of themselves to actually get the job done. So therein lies my boss move number two. Lead with intention, lead with purpose, build relationships. Now, we all want to be, or to grow to an envisaged future that we see ourselves in. I want to dare you all in my boss move number three to begin to think about how do you live in that future? And then ask yourself, in that future that I envision, what then do I need to build from today so that I can begin to build what is missing? The world today is a world of chaos, especially post-COVID. So many things got disrupted, the things that we believed in, the way we worked, the way we related. At two years ago, before COVID, if we said we wanted to have an online conference, it would be very something that would be very alien to us. And even for those who, who knew it, they would probably not find it as a right way of connecting. Yet today, online, working from home, has really, really uh, kind of shaped uh, the way we engage and connect as a human race. So how then do you grow in this beautiful, uh, fertile chaos that is the world that it is in today? Now, so I read somewhere a statement, I think it's a book called Originals, if I'm not wrong. And they said that successful originals will normally question the defaults and look at the unfamiliar in an unfamiliar way. Now to be able to do that, you must be somebody who is willing to think outside the normal coloring that the world uses. You must be somebody who is willing to embrace uncertainty, to be able to dance in it. You must be somebody who's willing to ignore the social approvals, not to be worried about the costs of that conformity and have the courage of conviction to be able to carry you on the path that you choose to get you to that future. Remember what I said, boss move number three, we must live in the future and then build back from there what is missing to actually get us there. Now, one of the things that I personally believe and my motto that you will see in many spaces that you'll find myself in, let's say I live for the audience of one. The world is my stage, the Lord is my audience and I live for the, I live for the audience of one. 
that may sound a bit dramatic, but for me, it has enabled me to sit back and say, remember I said earlier about a legacy mindset? It has enabled me to think about the day that I transition and I go home to rest with my heavenly father. The day when people are coming to all to my funeral and they are all coming to say, this is who Sylvia was and everything. What is the story that I want them to write? Sometimes when people come to me for coaching and they say, I want to do life coaching or even mentor me and stuff. I normally say the conversation has to be very personal because it's not just about work. It's about, because the way you are as a human being really determines how you show up in your relationships, how you show up at work, how you show up in all the different spaces that you're in. And therefore it's impossible to mentor or coach somebody even at work if you're not talking to them about who they are as an individual. Now, when I think about that, that, that I, so I, I normally tell guys, okay, so let's draw your river of life. This is where you are. This is where you anticipate your river to end. And we want to write that story. So I dare people and say, would you be so courageous as to write your eulogy today? What do you want us to say about you the day when we come to your funeral? Okay, many people are superstitious, probably some of you are in the audience and they say, how can you tell me to do something like that? You know, everybody gets all up. But I think what that prompts you is to begin to think about what are the things that I'm doing today that are building towards that future that I anticipate. And that is why I'm saying, live in the future, envisage that future. As human beings, we think in pictures. If I tell you car, right now. I'm sure many of you will see pictures, depending on your favorite car. Some of you will see a BMW, others, I don't know, will see a Range Rover, others will see a Toyota, others will see a Datsun, I don't know. But when I say a word, immediately what comes to your mind is a picture. If I say kind, immediately what comes to your mind is a picture of somebody who's probably kind or a kind moment that you experience. Now, if you think about it like that, as even as a boss at work, what is that future that you see? What is that future that you see for your business? What is that future that you see for your career? What is that future that you see for your family? What is that future that you see for your finances? What is that future that you see for your bank account? Then what are the choices, the decisions, the relationships, the places that you find yourself in that are actually building towards that future that you want to create? As I said, that requires a special ingredient mix of ignoring social approvals, not being worried about the cost of nonconformity, because that is what is authentic to you. I think one of the things that we struggle with in the world today is that we all try to conform. We all want to be like the next person. What joy is there in that? How then do you, we, we all have different DNA, we all have different fingerprints for heaven's sake. Why would you want to conform to be like the next person? But many of us do that because we do not want to be courageous. We do not want to be standard. So who is the audience that you're living for? Are you living for the audience of the world? Are you living for the audience of your family? Are you living for the audience of your mother? Are you living for the audience? I don't know. But you have to determine what is that audience that you're living for and then begin to make your decisions from today to be able to help you to get there. My last item, and my last boss move, is we must also become individuals who are willing to be the heroes that the world needs. And that means that we are willing to commit to bold action. That requires us to be individuals who seek to understand rather than to be understood. We must be individuals who are willing to listen more. I read once a quote, I think by an Indian philosopher who said that the highest form of intelligence is having the ability to observe without evaluating. Because I think one of the things that really, really fails us as humanity is that we have become too judgmental 
of the situations and spaces that we find ourselves in. That's why Twitter does so well, because everybody has an opinion about everything. But I want to kind of inspire us to become people who are willing. That's why we, have, by the way, God gave us one mouth and two ears and two eyes, not two mouths. Because we must be people who should be willing to listen more, seek to understand the context that we actually find our space, ourselves in, if we are going to be the hero that the world needs. There's a lot of pain in this world. One of the reasons why I love to work in the technology space and why I have worked in Safaricom for the length of time that I have worked in is because I think technology offers a fantastic tool to actually be able to drive the change in society that we seek to see. I'm very, very, very passionate about Africa. And Africa suffers from a big challenge of lack of infrastructure, which I believe technology can actually help bridge. But we can't be able to come up with these, those innovations. We can't be able to define the things that are going to change the lives of our people, even our own people, if we are not willing to immerse ourselves in that context, to listen more, to be more empathetic, so that then we can be able to commit to that bold action that is required to make us the hero that the world needs. And we're not doing it because we want to be heroes. We are doing it because you ultimately become a hero because of seeking to, say, to change somebody's life. That is your ultimate uh, motivation. I think living life from that perspective where you live uh, your life not for yourself, but you live life for others is what truly, truly, truly creates meaningful living. I want to wind off by saying that all of us are here because we want to create a future that we all want to be proud of, a future that we actually want to live in. Every day, even as I'm making my choices, I ask myself, are the choices that I'm making creating a future that I want my daughter Jason and Jasmine uh, to live in? It's important for us to recognize that every day, the daily routines that we have, the conversations we find ourselves in, all have an impact on creating that future. I want to challenge you all, even as I challenge myself, and ask, even as you're making that boss move that you want to make for the future, Is it for you or is it in the service of others? I have found, and I put my hand on heart, that giving your life in the service of others will ultimately create a leader, or if I use your words, a boss that will have an impact that will not only be within the space that you live, but be truly generational and impactful. Be conscious of the words that you speak because they are seeds of life. Leaders, when they speak, should be very careful because you create the energy and the mood of your organization. Our conversations, shape our culture and our culture lives in the conversations that we have. If you want to create that future, start it by watching the things that you speak today, the conversations you enroll yourself in today, and then ask yourself, is this going to create impact that is going to be generational and ultimately create that future that I want to create for myself? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Wow, Sylvia, that was so impactful. You really touched my heart. You gave us so many nuggets and I can see in the chat, you have been quoted over and over and over again. So not, not just your four main points, but pretty much so many poignant things that you said are all coming through the chat. Someone saying how empowering you've been, how you've touched us and you truly have. You are 
a real boss lady because you are a great human being fast. It is evident from everything you have said. So that I will ask if you will take a few questions, just maybe three questions in the interest of time. So I invite our audience to write any questions you may have in the chat because I could just hear all kinds of powerful wow comments, profound. So ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to ask Sylvia. She's here for us some questions she has told us how you have to be intentional how you have to be a great human being let's hear some questions that she you have anything burning for you let us hear her answer us today i'm continuing to see wonderful comments thank you for inspiring us kudos a true boss i'm waiting for a question very insightful, <laughs> very intentional. Boss moves should be in the service. I can see a question. Us. Somebody's now. asking. Okay. Absolutely. You hear me? You've got the question. Yes, so, I saw one. I saw one. Okay, Somebody's so, asking yeah. about pain. But, uh, pain always but, makes us strong. What pain has made you the person you are today? <laughs> that is so true. I think if life didn't have values, how, what would be the joy in the mountains? Because when you're in the valley, that's when you realize um, the value of those happy moments. Um, I, I have suffered pain um, in relationships. I have suffered pain at work. Um, I have suffered rejection. Um, I remember some of you probably know I was supposed to go and work in Tanzania as CEO, got caught up in work permit issues and many other things, ended up not going. Um, I remember even when I was growing up as a young girl, I remember the first rejection from my first boyfriend when I found out he was going out with another girl while I was in the same school. But those moments never leave you. Um, but I think ultimately what pain does. And even I believe that even for those of us who are Christians or spiritual, God allows us to go through pain because it reminds us of our own humanity. It reminds us of, and allows us to connect to our emotions. It allows us to be resilient. It reminds us about the things that are important to us. Pain reminds us of our humanity. And I think when you're in, it, it, it also allows you to be able to connect with other people who go through the same. I know many times the messes that I have found myself in have allowed me to form a message that then becomes an inspiration to somebody else because they can see that I actually went through it and I got through on the other side. I have actually found my most defining moments in life are not in my high mountain top kind of experiences, but in the valley experiences because they shape my character they build my capacity. They make me more humane. I read somewhere the other day, somebody who was talking about, I think they were in an interview and they were asked, why do you think we should give you this role? And they said, well, first of all, because I have the capacity to be able to do it. So I have the skill set, I have the degrees, I have the experience, the number of years that I've put in. But more importantly, not only do I have the capacity, but I have the character to actually be able to drive what is required in this role. Why is character built? It's built in your points of discomfort. Character is built outside your normal comfort zone. Character is built in your moments of pain. Character is built in your valley seasons. So embrace it and rejoice in your barrenness because it will produce a human being who will be able to take on whatever the world brings your way. Wow, beautifully answered. And that tells us when pain is given to you, do not be afraid of it, embrace it because you will grow, you will learn from it. Thank you, Sylvia. And I'm, it's great to know that people are communicating directly with you. I'll pick another question from the chat. There are so many coming through. So you're in trouble, but here goes. So someone's asking, how do you find that balance? And this is from Purity. How do you find that balance 
between trying to take care of yourself and as a boss leader, trying to take care of others? How do you find that balance? Um, quite honestly, I don't. I've <laughs> never found it. So what I've learned to do is to integrate. And that's where the point of purpose becomes then very important because if what I'm doing at work on a daily basis is living up or adding up to my individual purpose as a human being, then that interconnection happens and then it makes it easier to be able to bear. I mean, today is a Saturday, I'm here, right? I normally uh, don't do any work related or even speaking events on Saturdays, but because this is connected to my purpose, preparing for this allowed me to, be, to take some time to reflect on my own life experiences, reflect on my own journey. And therefore it is enriching me. And even as I share with you, I'm also taking the time to, I think in the sharing, I'm also picking up a lot of things about myself that probably I was blind to. Uh, and even in some of the questions that are, are coming through the audience. So it ends up enriching me. And therefore, in spite of the fact that it's a Saturday and I'm on a Zoom call, which I'm rarely on on a Saturday, the fact that I'm able to integrate what I'm doing now with what is my life purpose then makes it work. So in a way, I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm offering something to you, but I'm also caring for myself in being in this space. So I think it's about being very choiceful about your decisions. That's what I've learned. Um, being choiceful about are the relationships that you have in your life, whether it's your girlfriends or the guys you hang out with or your, the places where you work, are they building you? Are they taking away from you? Is it filling your cup or taking away from your cup? You may ne never be fully in control of the kind of people that you find yourself space in, but you can choose how you respond to those situations so that they end up caring for you rather than taking away from you. I've also learned to, to, to take priority of the things that I care about. Sometimes they are not, they don't make sense to others. So for example, one of the things I'm really passionate about is fitness. I discovered fitness three, three years ago or so, and I devote my time to it. I go to the gym at 3.45, 4 a.m. Some people tell me, that's crazy. You should be sleeping, you should be what? But I know what it does to my mental health. I know what it cares, what it does for my own care. I ended up uh, becoming very close with my sisters because I work out with them every morning. We work out four or five days a week. So I get to see my sisters and some of my close friends who we work out with. And it has become something that's important to me that I'm willing to invest in and that I'm willing to care for. So what are the things that are important to you? And then how do you then figure out how you integrate them in your life? But more importantly, for, for especially for work and yourself, just pursue things that integrate with your purpose. And even if they don't now, remember what we said earlier, live in the future and then build back from today to get to that future. You can then, just the fact that you, you make a call to begin to live in that space is going to be so energizing to you. And suddenly you'll discover the universe will open up to a line to get you to that space that then allows you to be able to achieve both. So in summary, integrate. Thank you, Sylvia. And we are honored that you have given your Saturday to us and yet you share it with us like it's an honor for you and it's your sacrifice. We truly, truly appreciate that. And it's great to know you find that interconnected with your purpose because that makes it so much more meaningful for us and it is evident from the impact you're creating. There Thank are you. so many more questions, but I'll just give you one last one. And I'll invite you then to share with us how you can answer all these other questions. But let me give you the third one. And so, dear friends, I'm taking it on a first come first serve basis. So I'm hoping Sylvia will tell us where she will answer the rest of the questions, hopefully in the chat, hopefully she'll tell us more later. But the third question comes from Ryle. And I believe she's referring to when you said to us not to conform, you know, not to really worry about what others think about us. But she says, how am I expected to live when people consider you confrontational or 
you know, unconventional. How do you live with that? So I think the first thing is that you must have a very high level of self-awareness, right? Um, I never used to think of myself as judgmental until God allowed me to go through a relationship that really exposed how judgmental I was. I used to still talk about people and say, how can you be judgmental? I never used to pick up the mirror and point at myself. But that relationship really allowed me to see how I always used to jump to conclusions. And when I went back to drill down, I realized it came from my own insecurities, past things that had happened to me. And I think allowing that to surface and dealing with it um, helped me to be able to overcome that. And I'm still working on it. So first of all, there must be a very high sense of self-awareness of who you are. And maybe people say you're confrontational because you are, right? So that's, that's the first thing. So the thing is, you take the feedback, you look at yourself, whichever way, whether you want to say to your family, friends, or you want to, I don't know, whichever way you want to do it, you take, you take the feedback, right? Then after that, um, you then define what is the path that I want to be on. Is it a path that is growing me? Is it allowing me to get to that future that I had envisaged? And then ask yourself, what is the cost of that path? Even the good book says that before you pick up any path, ask yourself, what is the cost? Because everything comes at a cost. For me to be lean and fit, I have to wake up in the morning to go early to the gym because I can't make any other time during the day. It costs me my sleep, right? So there's always a cost to everything. And probably what you'll find, Ryle, is that part of that cost is a cost of social approvals, non-conformity. But it comes after you have then done your evaluation of yourself and then having that high level of self-awareness and kind of charting the path that you want to be on, then being very clear what this is going to cost you. I think once you go through that and have that meeting with yourself, it becomes easier to bear. And even as you go along, because you've already thought about it, remember you have lived in that future, you have anticipated it. When it shows up, it doesn't surprise you. And also it doesn't hurt as much because you knew it was going to come. So I think just that whole thing of doing your own self-evaluation first and then determining that path and counting the costs will probably help you in terms of dealing with that. I hope that helps. Thank you. That's brilliant advice because that is evident as you grow up the ladder they will, you will never get everyone agreeing with you. There will be variances. You will always have people, some thinking you're confrontational, however much you try to be accommodating and however much you try to be a good person and care for people. So that's very, very helpful. So Sylvia, maybe you can just tell us how, you know, I want to challenge you. You are a boss lady maybe how you will give the answers to the rest of the questions. There are very many, maybe just share with us where people can reach you perhaps if it's not here, because I know we'll be breaking shortly. The red flag is showing us that time is up. <laughs> well, you could invite me to another Toastmasters Masters conference or, or event and I could answer the rest of the questions. But I mean, um, well, when you find me, um, I wish I could tell you that I respond to all DMs that come to me on IG or Facebook, but I don't. But I guess if our paths are meant to intersect, they will. And I'm always willing and ready to be able to offer my time um, and the experiences that God has allowed me to go through to be able to share. I'll try to go through some of the questions right now as we finish and answer them directly in the chat to those who have asked. But if I don't get to you, uh, Silmulinge uh, is my acronym what is it acronym of my the name i use on instagram facebook you can reach out and then maybe we can have a conversation my personal Thank email you. is smulinge at me.com if you want to also reach out to me you can drop me an email and then we can see what happens but thank you so oh. much let me say i'm grateful the other day i had somebody say that what you appreciate appreciates 
So I appreciate you and I hope by appreciating you will also appreciate as an organization and realize all the goals that you seek um, to achieve for yourselves. I'll put my, my email on the chat. I see someone is requesting for it. I'll do that before I do. Thank you so much for having me here for the conversation. Thank you again, Sylvia. And you have put yourself in trouble because we take that. We will take you on. We will invite you again <laughs> because the nuggets you have given us have just given us that preview into how much more you can give us. So we will definitely call upon you. Sylvia, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate that you will answer the rest of the questions. I'll just recap some of the main highlights, you know, about being a great human being, living with intention, with purpose, building relationships, living in the future, and then taking a step back and saying, what do I do? so that I, that future is what I want to live in and then being that hero, living boldly. Thank you very much for giving us how we can be a boss lady, perhaps not catching up with you, but one day. We appreciate <laughs> we you. We are all boss Thank ladies you. or boss men wherever we are. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, Thank you. very much again. Bye. Thank you for having me. God bless you all. Bye. God bless you too. Back to you. This Master John Zira, the MC of the day. It has been my privilege signing off, Rosirana. <laughs>